Amen. Let's grab our Bibles out, if you would, and turn them with me to the book of Acts, chapter number 9, as we're continuing our series through this book of Scripture. We've entitled the series, Victorious Church. We're seeing how the church was built on the foundation of the Lord Jesus Christ. And through Him, we do have victory. Aren't you glad the Bible tells us that we are more than conquerors through Him that loved us? And today, if you're part of His church, I want you to know uh, we still have great days ahead of us. Uh, We're looking for our Savior. And I'm excited to dig in today as we continue this study, Acts chapter number 9. We're going to begin reading with verse number 23 here in a moment. We've entitled this message, A Victorious Camaraderie. I want you to continue to see the connection points that these early Christians in the Spirit of God are making with each other, how they're ministering to one another, how they're encouraging one another, how they're protecting one another, how they're really living life together as a people of God. It's something I think is missing in our churches today. A lot of churches become nothing more than social clubs or events that we might come and we might connect with, and and we're missing those layers of entrenched relationships. Where as the people of God, we come to rely on each other and sharpen one another and disciple one another and and really do Christian life together as his people. And so I'm encouraged and challenged in that. As we study this this morning, I hope you will be as well. Acts chapter number 9, we'll begin reading with verse 23. If you found your place and you're physically able to stand, let's stand together out of respect for the reading of the word of God. Notice with me here, beginning in verse 23. And after that many days were fulfilled, the Jews took counsel to kill him. Now, this is speaking of Saul. Last week, we saw the glorious transformation of Saul. He was a persecutor, and now he's a believer. His life is completely changed. And as a result of that, he's now declaring Christ. He's now one of those people that are of the way. And as a result of that, the Jews want to kill him now. They're after him. They want his life. Oh, how the script has flipped in the life of Saul. We see that here in verse 23. They took counsel to kill him. Verse 24, but their laying wait was known of Saul. And they watched the gates day and night to kill him. Then the disciples took him by night, and I love this, and let him down by the wall in a basket. There's not many times when you're reading through Scripture that the Mission Impossible theme music tick kicks in, but this is one of those moments, okay? They're letting him down the wall in a basket. I love that. Verse 26, And when Saul was come to Jerusalem, he essayed to join himself to the disciples, but they were all afraid of him and believed not that he was a disciple. But Barnabas took him and brought him to the apostles and declared unto him how, or them how he had seen the Lord in the way and that he had spoken to him and how he had preached boldly at Damascus in the name of Jesus. And he was with them, coming in and going out at Jerusalem. And he spake boldly in the name of the Lord Jesus, and disputed against the Grecians, but they went about to slay him. Which when the brethren knew, they brought him down to Caesarea, and sent him forth to Tarsus. Then had the churches rest throughout all Judea and Galilee. What an amazing passage. And in it we're going to see a victorious camaraderie. So let's pray and let's ask God to knit our hearts with this truth this morning, that we might be also a people that are knit together in his truth and in his love. Let's pray. Lord, we're thankful that we've gathered together this morning on this first day of the week celebrating who you are. May that not go unnoticed by us, that that we have this in common, all of us that believe in you, that know you, are connected because of you. Help that connection to not be shallow or surface, help that connection to not just be leveraged for what we individually can get out of it, but help us to be a people that are centered around you, that are found in you, and as a result of that, are in unity together as brethren. Help us, Lord, to know what that means. Help us in these last days as the night grows darker, that our light of your gospel would burn brightly as we connect and gather together. And we'll thank you for it, in Jesus' name, amen. Thank you, you may be seated. A victorious camaraderie. I want you to think about that just for a moment before we dig into our passage. That that camaraderie, that that closeness, that, that unique intimacy 
that you share with other people who have commonality with you. Whether that be a family, whether that be a group of friends, whether as we're seeing it now, it be the church of God. There are connection points that we share with other people, and it's very unique for the church. It's very unique for believers, because the common bond that we have isn't a preference, and that common bond that we have isn't a hobby, and that common bond that we have isn't a taste for a certain thing. The common bond that we have is the one who has made all things new in our lives, and that is the Lord Jesus Christ. How many of you know that's a good thing to have in common with another person? And we've seen that all the way throughout the book of Acts thus far. I want you to think all the way back to the beginning of the book of Acts. As Jesus is ascending up into heaven, there's a close-knit group of disciples that Jesus leaves behind. These are disciples, by the way, that when Jesus was captured and crucified, they scattered. Some even denying him, famously Peter, denying him three times. And now they've all collected back together again. They watched Jesus ascend up into heaven. And Jesus says, you go into Jerusalem and you gather together. You share your common bond in prayer. And you wait for the common bond of the filling of the Holy Spirit of God. Hey, are you glad this morning that if that brother or sister next to you know Jesus, they have the same Spirit of God in them that you have in you? What a great bond that is. And so they waited in Jerusalem and they prayed together seeking the will of God. We find in Acts chapter number 2 that the Spirit is indeed given. They're all indwelt with the Spirit of God. And many that day are saved and added to the church and filled with the Spirit of God. And we find that that bond only grows and progresses as persecution sets in. The bond grows closer We find that there are even some, another gentleman we're going to talk about in our passage today named Barnabas who sell their lands because the Christians being persecuted are getting turned out of their families and getting turned out of their jobs and they're suffering and they're struggling. And so they sell some of their extra lands and they bring the proceeds and they begin to share it with one another. I mean, that's awesome. That's, That's a great body of believers nurturing and caring for one another in that common bond of the Lord Jesus Christ. We find even in our chapter today, in Acts chapter number 9, that Saul was on the road to Damascus to persecute the believers that were at Damascus. And he meets Jesus, and his life is transformed. He gets saved, and a man by the name of Ananias, who fearful that he might get killed by Saul, he's called of God to go and minister to him. And there's a bond for him there as Ananias leads Saul into Damascus, where those, as if they were scales, fell from his eyes, and Saul began to see, and he began to minister And it brings us to our point this morning where we continue to see this camaraderie, this connection between believers. Not a surface connection, a deep connection, a shared struggle of persecution, a shared filling of the Spirit of God, a shared call to take the gospel all over the world. So as we look at a victorious camaraderie today, I want us to start with this. I want us to, first of all, in our passage, see a basket. I want us to see a basket I love, again, this passage here. Let's begin at verse number 23. And after that, many days were fulfilled. So there was some time for this camaraderie to build between Saul and these disciples in Damascus. Uh, We're told that this is probably a time period of about three years. Uh, Paul, Saul at this time, writes to the church of Galatia and shares with them that he spends three years in Damascus learning and growing and being discipled. And during these three years, there's a camaraderie that's building between these disciples that once were fearful of Saul, but now are connected to him in this bond of the Spirit and in this bond of the Gospel and in this bond of Jesus. I think this is, I think this is beautiful. You can take us as broken sinners living our lives separate from each other, maybe even despising and hating each other at one point, and you bring Jesus into the mix, and how many of you are glad this morning God can take two people that hate each other and make them friends because of Jesus? I thought this was a friendlier bunch this morning. (laughs) And I'm glad that that work of grace can continue in our lives. Hey, if you don't think your, your marriage issues can be solved, if you don't think that your parent child relationships can't be solved if you don't think that 
your brother and sister relationships can be solved. If you don't think that your communion in the house of God with someone that you've developed a rift with can't be solved, just think about how now the Apostle Paul is being embraced by these believers that he sought to kill. Jesus makes all this possible. He builds that union. He brings that camaraderie. He, he unites us together. And so there's about three years that go by here, these many days, and now this Saul who sought under Jewish authority to kill Christians is now uh, hunted by these Jews. Notice with me, verse 23, the Jews took counsel to kill him. He's now the one sought after. He's now the one that the eyes of persecution are glaring at. Saul is now the one that has the target on his back. And I want you to think about what it's like for a new believer. Remember that for a moment, you who've been saved for a long time. We, we like to market and, and, and pack it salvation together in the modern church as some kind of sales hook in it that if you'll get saved, then, then all your problems will go away and life will become a bed of roses and you'll be on the road to easy street and health, wealth, and fame will come your way if you know Jesus because we have victory in Him. And I'm going to tell you, not through example in Scripture and not through verse in Scripture does it ever say getting saved will make your life easier. Nowhere does it say that. The Bible does not teach that. In fact, I'm going to tell you, there are some people out there who don't know Jesus in our world today. They're doing pretty well. They're living pretty comfortable lives. They've got a pretty comfortable house and a really nice car and a really nice job and travel and, you know, and they don't know Jesus. And they're doing pretty well materialistically speaking God never said when you get saved your life is going to be easy but, but how many of you are glad this morning when you get saved your life is redeemed your sins are gone as we sing about this morning those chains are gone and we've been set free and what Saul is now experiencing is not ease I mean he's been blinded he's been led into Damascus the Jews now want to kill him it's not like Paul's life got easier Paul had it pretty good as we studied Saul we found that he was at the upper echelon of, of the Jewish religion he uh, held uh, authority. He had papers to go into Damascus to capture believers and bring them back to persecute them. He was smart. He was effective. He was esteemed. And now he's been cut off. The Jews that once revered him and sent him now seek to destroy him. And listen, when somebody gets saved, sometimes it doesn't get easier for him. Sometimes family doesn't like him as much anymore. Because now they've got a passion and they've got a heart for Jesus and that lost family who doesn't know the Lord yet doesn't understand what's changed. And I mean, you're going, you were just in church last week on Sunday. You're going again? And, and not only that, you're going to this adult Bible class and then not only that, but you're going to Wednesday evening Bible study? What kind of goof nut are you? And now you want to pray before you eat? And now you just keep talking to me about this Jesus? Hey, listen, let's not invite them over to Thanksgiving this year. And it can get difficult. Hey, not just with family. How many of you know sometimes friendships have to change too? The ones that we ran with before aren't going to be the ones that we run with now. They don't see the world the same. They don't see themselves the same. They don't see God the same. And the Bible tells us that we can't be unequally yoked together with unbelievers. What fellowship hath light with darkness? What, what fellowship has he that believeth with an unbeliever? What, what connection has the temple of God with idols? You see, when we get saved, like in Saul's life, things transform. And when things change, sometimes people leave. And it's hard. Because they're not there for us anymore. Sometimes new believers are ridiculed and it becomes very difficult for them. They wanted to kill Saul. But I love this in verse 24, notice with me, but their laying in wait was known of Saul and they watched the gates day and night to kill him. <laughs> then the disciples took him by night and let him down by the wall in a basket. I love this. 
I love how when Saul trusted Christ, he wasn't left on his own, but now there was a camaraderie around Jesus that was built where these believers who had been persecuted, where these believers had probably known what it was like to run for their lives, now knew how to come to Saul's assistance and knew how to help him. How many of you understand this morning, we all need someone in our life that will throw us over the wall in a basket. I preached that this morning and somebody left, shook my hand and said, Pastor, I would love to throw you over the wall in a basket. (laughs) Didn't know if I felt good about that or not. The Lord knew we would need that connection, that fellowship. And I'm concerned about the church today. I'm concerned that we've made church not about the connection with people of God, but we've made church about what people individually can get out of it. So we have to have this program and that program. I'm not against programs. We have programs. But it becomes more of a shopping list and smorgasbord so that people can find what they want, but they don't want to have any connection with others. Not that deep connection, not that abiding connection, not that throw you over the wall in a basket connection, not that come to your aid connection, not to give you food and comfort connection, not that I'm going to pray for you, I'm going to pray for you around the clock, brother and sister, because you're under deep duress and you're grieving and you're struggling. I'm going to tell you, we're selfish in America today. We're all about me, myself, and I, and we need to get back to caring for others again. Hey, listen, we've got it easy. We've had it easy for a long time. We've had it too easy, to be honest with you. In the United States of America, as believers, we've not had to really put up with a whole lot of anything. We've not really known what it is to endure persecution. I speak with missionaries in foreign countries that actually meet undercover in fear for their very lives. And they know what it means to be there for each other. They know what it means to have each other's back. They know what it means to have a basket ready. They know what it means to love and care for deeply a brother and sister in Christ. And now we've come to a place where it's just a fad. It's just a cliche. Church is just something we attend and go to. And it's kind of just a soft spot in our week that we can have some good feelings around. But I'm telling you, the church of God isn't about the gathering place necessarily. It's about the people in that place. It's about the souls in that place. It's about the struggles in that place. It's about the deep connections in that place. And oh, that we would know one another in Christ. Here, Saul, going through this amazing transformation, being disconnected from all the people he had come to know and rely on, now found this camaraderie, this victorious camaraderie with people who were willing to grab a basket and put him over the wall and be there for him in his time. And he can ask you a question this morning. Who are you holding a basket for? Who are you holding a rope for? When's the last time you discipled someone? When's the last time you walked through a struggle with somebody and, and was there for them with Scripture and was there for them with prayer and was there for them even if it cost you in sacrifice, even if you might have been implicated in the whole basket conspiracy? When was the last time you were there holding the rope and grabbing onto the basket? Hey, who's got the rope for you? Who's got the basket for you? I'm I'm telling you. I'm telling you, you might not think you need it right now. In fact, you think you don't. You think you're doing fine. You're going to leave this place. You're going to take a few good notes with you. You're going to enjoy the song or two that we sang. And you're going to go home and say, that was a great day at church. And you're going to go about the rest of your week. And you're not going to have to consider really anything else but yourselves. But when's the last time you carried somebody else in a basket with you? The time will come where you'll need somebody to have a basket for you. Maybe even concerning our faith in this country. We we may not see it, but I would be surprised if our children and grandchildren didn't see more of a struggle in living out their faith in our country as time moves forward. And if we're not teaching our children how to hold the basket for each other, hold the rope for each other, you know, you know where it starts? It starts in the classes downstairs. It starts in the youth group over there. Parents, do, do your children, do your youth see you holding the rope for people and the basket for people, or do they see you throwing them under the bus? Do, do, they, do they see the people of God as just being, well, you can take them or leave them. You can 
Take them anywhere you go. Go here, go there. It doesn't matter. If we don't like this group, we'll go to this group. What are, we, what are we showing? Our children and grandchildren, what are we showing in our churches today? If we're not willing to say, I'm going to hold a basket, I'm going to hold a rope, I'm going to dig in, I'm going to struggle with you, brother. Doesn't it say that in 1 Corinthians chapter number 12, that whether the whole body uh, suffer, we all suffer together. And if the whole body uh, be lifted up, we're all lifted up together. Hey, listen, it's not about any one person, it's about us together as the body and how we minister to each other. As we consider this victorious camaraderie, we, we see a basket. Do you have a basket? Are you ready to go with your basket? Secondly, we see a Barnabas. We see a Barnabas. Notice with me, if you would, as we drop down to verse number 26. And when Saul was come to Jerusalem, he essayed to join himself to the disciples. But notice this. They were all afraid of him, and for good reason. I mean, this goes to show you how effective Saul was in his destruction of the church. This gap of time had transpired, and still the people in Jerusalem were fearful that Saul was back. Oh man, he's back? Are you kidding me? He must have wiped people out in Damascus, and now he's back here to to kill us again. But no, Saul's life had changed, and he desired to join himself to the disciples, but they were afraid of him. And notice what happened here in verse number 26, and believed not that he was a disciple. How many of you realize Christians get it wrong from time to time too? We tend to have short memories about the harm we inflict on others and long memories about the harm people inflict on us. Now, I'm not minimizing this. This was no small harm. Many of these people in Jerusalem witnessed Saul overseeing the death of their dear brother, Stephen. This was no small wound. But Christian, if these disciples could eventually embrace Saul, why can't we reach a hand out to someone who seems unlikely to come to Christ and help them in that process of walking with the Lord.